Hello and welcome to the second Elliott School of International Affairs online current student panel. Uh, my name is Josh Fulton and I am the Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions here at the Elliott School of International Affairs. And I'm so happy to welcome you to this evening and want to congratulate you all on your admission to the Elliott School. Uh, before I introduce our panelists this evening, I did want to just quickly go over uh, a couple different ins and outs of how this session will run and also to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in today and bearing with us as we are navigating all of our admitted student events to virtual content uh, as we are navigating through this global pandemic. We want to make sure that we're keeping everyone safe and hope that you all are staying healthy and that your quarantines so far have been both productive and as much fun as they possibly can be. Um, so I want to cover a couple quick talking points about how this session will run and how uh, or just instructions for our attendees. So first and foremost, please make sure that your microphones are muted at all times. We want to make sure that you can only hear myself and our panelists as clearly as possible with no background noises or interruptions. I have already set up the session to mute you when you have entered the WebEx session. However, please double check that the microphone button either next to your name in the participant list or on the bottom horizontal toolbar where you are seeing my video feed is colored red with a dash through the microphone, uh, meaning that you are muted. Please also make sure that your webcams are also off. This feature is also located on the bottom horizontal toolbar below my video feed and should be colored red with a dash across the camera icon. The only webcams that should be on are mine and our five current student panelists. Uh, it's not that we don't want to see your bright shining faces. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, the only individuals that you're seeing are myself and the student panelists when they are answering your questions. Uh, speaking of questions, when you do have questions that you would like to address to our panelists, please type them in the chat box feature located in the lower right hand corner of your screen. If you do not see a chat box feature, uh, you can open it by going once again to that horizontal toolbar located on the bottom of your screen below my video feed, and you'll be able to see a chat bubble icon to open or close the chat box. I will look at the questions you type in and ask them to our panelists directly in the order in which they were submitted. And when you do have a question you would like to ask, please feel free to address to everyone in the chat box so that if another admitted student has a similar question, they can see that it has already been asked. Also, please feel free to address questions generally to all panelists, or you can also address questions to a specific panelist. If it is to a specific panelist tonight, please just let me know who you would like it addressed to so I can make sure that I'm informing the correct individual. Uh, I am also recording this live session as well. If you would like to view this session again, please feel free to email us at esiagrad at gwu.edu. And I'll have one of my colleagues type that email in the chat box feature as well, just in case if you weren't able to jot that down. Uh, and we can send you the downloadable and streaming links to this session. I will also make sure that this recorded session is uploaded into our admitted student website and also into our weekly admitted student newsletter that I send out every Monday. And the last item I wanna cover is in terms of timing. We will conduct the panel this evening right up until 7 p.m. Eastern time. I will announce a notification when it is five minutes till the hour and provide the panelists one final question to answer. If there are still any outstanding questions that we did not get to, <clears throat> excuse me, during the session, please email them to us once again at esiagrad at gwu.edu. We will help either address your question or put you in contact with one of our panelists and uh, they can help answer your questions. All right, I believe that should cover all of the basics for how our session will run this evening. So without further ado, I will introduce our student panelists. Uh, while our panelists are being introduced, please feel free to go ahead and begin typing in any questions that you have into the chat box feature located in the lower right hand corner of your screen. If you have some questions that you would like to address right off the bat. Um, but up first, our first panelist is Ana Diaz. 
who is a first year European and Eurasian studies student. So Anna, I will have you go ahead and just introduce yourself further by telling us a little bit more about your specialization topic in your program, where you work, intern or volunteer, and also one of the following things uh, about your favorite Elliott Elliot School experience thus far, whether that is your favorite class or professor you've taken, a student organization you're a part of, or uh, just a favorite Elliott School memory that you have. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Diaz um, in the European and Eurasian program. Uh, my concentration is Eastern European politics, uh, mainly the Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Slovakia, those are the countries that I'm focusing on right now. I work at the Hispanic Institute, Cisneros, which is right next to the school. And I also work for the Elio School. I'm a research assistant for a professor. Um, I have two favorite professors that I, I've worked with before and I love. And I recommend you all to take if you're interested in Eastern European politics. Uh, that would be Wolchik and Agnew. They're amazing. So if you have any more questions about them, let me know. Great, thank you, Anna. Our next student is Caleb Darger, who is a first year global communication student. Uh, so very similar to Anna, uh, Caleb, if you could just introduce yourself a bit further, telling us a little bit more about your specialization topic, where you work, intern or volunteer, and your favorite LA school experience thus far. Sure. Um, yeah, I, so I'm in the global communications program, which is, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of actually a joint program with the Elliott School and the School of the Col Columbian College School of Media and Public Affairs. So it's a perfect program if you're someone like me who's interested in international affairs, but also kind of um, media and communication and things like that. So um, the the program is really geared towards you know learning how uh, those worlds intersect um, and. So, so it kind of makes makes it interesting because I'm taking courses um, in a totally different school with with people who are, you know, just studying uh, public diplomacy and things like that. But also um, my concentration is um, East Asian studies. So I'm taking a lot of Elliott School courses as well. Um, so I actually work at the Elliott School. I started working there after I, um, towards the end of my first semester. So. Um, I kind of got the experience of doing both uh, full-time school and then switched to part-time once I, uh, after, after that sem semester ended. So, so I'm working full-time. Um, and I, I work at the, uh, it's kind of, it's under the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies, um, but it's, we work with um, foreign area officers in the military. So it's this weird niche um, initiative in the, under the LA school. But, um, I have to say my my favorite professor that I've taken a class from so far is actually a class I'm in right now. It's called strategic political communication. It's not uh, technically the Elliott School, so that's taught by Peter Loge, um, who's um, had a long career in uh, communications, um, strategic uh, political communication, things like that in Washington, um, and. So if you're interested in global communication um, or comms, media, journalism, anything like that, um, ask, ask any questions you have. Great, thank you, Caleb. Our next student presenter is Lami Ogunlawo, who is a second year international trade and investment policy studies student when she first applied, but now the program has undergone a name change to international economic policy. So Lami, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lami. I am, as Josh said, a second year student in the MIEP program from the ITIP. Um, I currently work as a program assistant for MIEP, so I'm happy to talk about that as well, um, as opposed to just the student side of things. Uh, my favorite experiences, I think Elliot just offers so many things and you really have to take advantage of them. I used to be on the graduate student forum, which is the Elliot school graduate body that hosts weekly TNOs and works with other organizations to essentially host events that brings the Elliot school graduate population together. 
Um, and in terms of classes, I've, ta- I've had the opportunity to take so many classes in the business school. Um, I've taken classes it, with the applied econ program over at Columbian. So, and so I've taken a little bit in the different schools at GW. So I'm also happy to talk about that as well. Great, thank you, Lamy. Up next, we have Monica Jones, who is a second year international policy and practice student. Uh, so Monica, if you would like to introduce yourself as well. Sure. Uh, um, again, I'm a part of the MIPP program. Um, I'm focusing on national security and gender. Um, I work with the Department of Defense full time as a part of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, my program, I serve as a part time uh, student and I work full time with the department and I'm in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, focusing on workforce development policy, uh, where we do a lot of statutory and regulatory policy uh, to support the defense acquisition workforce. And I'd say my uh, favorite moment uh, was just this past March, uh, where I was a part of the student leadership group uh, with the Gender Equality Initiative and International Affairs, uh, where we sponsored the World Peace and Security uh, 2020 conference. Um, so that was a great time working together with the students and different professors um, in celebration of International Women's Day. Great, thank you, Monica. And last but not least is Sinthu Chithambaram, who is a second year international development studies student. So Sinthu, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Yes, absolutely. Hi, I'm Sinthu, and um, as Josh said, I'm a second year in the international development studies program. I'm specializing in health and gender, which I really enjoyed um, as an LH student because I've been able to take classes at the Milken Institute School of Public Health and the Columbian School of Arts and Sciences. So I've had a very interdisciplinary kind of um, program experience. Um, I currently work as a graduate teaching assistant for an undergraduate health policy course at the Milken School. But my first three semesters, I was just doing school full time and I wasn't working. So I'm happy to discuss that experience. Um, and I'm a Pickering Fellow, so I'll be working for the State Department after I graduate, and then I interned with the State Department last summer. Um, my favorite memory made, I think Elliot just has such great speakers that come in multiple times a week. And in March, I got to attend um, a leadership conversation with Ambassador Bill Taylor, who provided incredible testimony during the impeachment hearing. So just, you know, having these diverse voices of, you know, influential DC you know, characters has been amazing. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here this evening as current student panelists. Uh, I will now turn it over to the question and answer portion and begin taking questions from admitted students. So once again, for the admitted students tuning in tonight, please feel free to start typing in questions in the chat box in the lower right hand corner of your screen or you can find the chat bubble icon on the horizontal toolbar below the video feed, which you're seeing on the screen right now. But we do have uh, one student uh, who does have a question right off the bat who uh, asks, could the panelists also tell us a little bit more about their background in terms of nationality? I mean, I can start. I'm American, Indian American, but I'm not an international student. Um, so American, I'm I'm uh, from out west, so fairly new to DC as of the last couple of years. American, African American from uh, Richmond, Virginia. I am from Nigeria, so happy to speak about the international student experience as well. I was actually born and raised in Cuba. I'm a Cuban American, but yeah, it's very fun to explain to people that I'm uh, studying Eastern European politics. Well, I'm Cuban, as far as you can get from there, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so our next question is, is uh, specifically for Caleb, the student asks, if you had to start as a part-time student, what two classes would you recommend taking during the first semester? Um, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, 
the Elliott School kind of determines that for you, at least for the global comms program. So there are like three core required courses that that everybody has to take if you're in the Elliott School or in the global comms program. Um, so you know, there's um, international affairs cornerstone, which is basically you know just kind of the lays the groundwork of, in terms of like theory um, and, and basics for international affairs, and then took a media and foreign policy, which is a really great course. Um, and so, and those are just like required, you know, might as well get them out of the way. And then a research design course that kind of teaches you um, more like in-depth in -depth basics about um, how to conduct a study and, and do research and things like that. So uh, there's also like a economics course, you choose between one or two. Uh, I don't know how it is for the other programs, but for the global comms program, it's a survey of international economics, or I forget the other one because I chose to do the international economics. Um, but so that's like required, but you have like an option between the two. But yeah, like I say, for the first semester or two, you kind of are um, locked in for what courses you're taking. Um, and then it's just this semester that I took a, um, this is my second semester, but I took a an elective, which is, um, right now on the spot so my strategic political communication course is, is kind of a requirement but then i'm in a current issues current affairs of east asia so by your second semester you can take electives basically all right thank you uh so our next question is a little bit more mipp focused uh, so monica this one is probably best fit for you um, and this student asks, is it realistic to complete it in one year going full time? Um, absolutely. Um, there are some students that have been in the program with me, um, primarily um, folks that were serving as foreign area officers with the Army uh, who worked full time and completed the program full time. Um, what they did is they uh, took a course for each summer session. So I believe there's three summer sessions. Um, and they took a course for each of that. Um, so I will say it's, it's very challenging to do it in one year, um, but there are students that have been able to. I would just recommend uh, working uh, with your advisor just to make sure that you've got your courses mapped out, um, understanding that every course that you may put on your um, comprehensive action plan, which is a layout of your courses for, um, for your degree, may not be available each semester. But if you sit down and have a plan, it's definitely doable um, to do part uh, to do full time. Great, thank you, Monica. So our next question is in terms of research assistant positions and teaching assistant positions at the Elliott School. Um, so feel free for anyone who's either working at the Elliott School or maybe not working at the Elliott School. Um, can speak on obtaining either a research assistant position or a teaching assistant position. Um, I can speak to obtaining a teaching assistant position. So there are usually two avenues. One, you can um, work with your school, so the Elliott School um, and professors you've taken to see if anyone is in need of their graduate teaching assistant. I actually applied to serve as a TA um, through the WID program. WID is writing in the disciplines, um, and it's an undergraduate program for GW students. I think all undergrads have to take two writing um, courses. And so they um, have a separate application process to become a TA for that, which I think is a little more structured. I think there are TA positions you can get through like a financial aid package, but I just applied through that general system, and that's why I was kind of placed in a health policy course, but I really enjoyed it. And that was one of my goals in graduate school, just to have some teaching experience. I'm actually a research assistant for both of my jobs. So the first one I, I did at Duelio, my program, the European Innovation Studies. They'll send you an email uh, on the fall in the spring, and they'll, they'll tell you that looking for research assistants, if you know of any professor that you want to work with, you can just go directly and approach them like I did because I needed the money, being realistic. And or you can just apply and they'll pair you with someone else. And then for my second job, um, I actually applied through the G web and I went personally to the, to the institute and I asked. And I said that I was actually very interested in doing research and 
even though it has nothing to do with my with what I'm studying, still gets you in the door. All right, thank you so much. Um, so this next question is, is in terms of working full time while also being a student. Uh, so this student asks, how do you find the right work and academic balance between working full time and being a student? I'm happy to address that uh, question. Um, so I work full time um, and am part of the MIPP program part time. Um, the biggest thing that I had to do was was really um, have the conversation with my employer um, to let them know that I would be taking courses. Uh, most of the courses are available, uh, many courses are available in the evening, um, but because I don't work close to campus, I had to make sure that I was leaving work at enough time in order to get to campus. Um, so having that conversation routinely uh, with your employer that there are days that you know you may need to be out to prepare for finals um, or that you need to be sure that you're leaving the office at a certain time so that you have enough time to get to campus, you know, understanding that if you don't work into DC, commuting into DC can be challenging. Um, but having a, a set out schedule for, you know, when finals are going to take place and ensuring that you're really being diligent about reviewing your syllabus so that you can know what the um, you know, what are, what are the trigger points going to be as far as, you know, larger papers being due, uh, midterm schedules, and really comparing that to um, your, your busy seasons with work and, and work deliverables and, and making sure that you don't have um, conflicts beforehand, uh, really just help with reducing the stress. And then I would say you definitely want to find opportunities where you can still participate in campus activities. Um, so I would just, you know, take a look at the different communications that come out and just mark off a couple of activities that you may want to go to a couple of, you know, a couple of weeks in advance. Um, so you can feel as though you're participating in the actual, you know, school, not just, you know, running to class and then running back home. All right, thank you so much, Monica. Uh, so this next question is uh, specifically for Synthu. Uh, they ask, what resource did you uh, think new grad students should make the most of in the International Development Studies program? So the IDS program is a very um, cohesive like, community. Our advisors, um, Dr. Roberts, Dr. Lederman, and Dr. Fink are all practitioners. So I think the best resources are obviously our um, the professors because they have great connections and just know a lot about development in general. We also have um, a very good kind of just administrative support team. So they send out weekly emails with job listings and things like that, um, events that they hold, um, coffees with alumni, panels, things like that. So just making sure to try to make it a goal to at least attend a few of those in a month if you can. Um, those are great ways to make connections, and especially if you're looking for jobs or internship opportunities and you see something on those emails, make sure to, you know, be transparent about that with our advisors because they usually are getting those emails from former students or from their connections, so that can really help you kind of get a, a leg up. But yeah, I think the resources are um, bountiful, and then Graduate Student Services at Elliott has been incredible. They're very helpful and have helped with resumes and interviews and everything else. So. I'm a great resource as well, as well for all students, not just IDEA. Thank you so much. So Caleb, this next question is specifically for you. Um, they ask, could you elaborate more on the journalism trajectory that you seem to be, sorry, seem to be pursuing through the Elliott School? Sorry, my, I just got out of the session briefly, so um, I disappeared, but. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'm particularly pursuing a, a journalism trajectory, though there are some of my program that are. Um, one of the reasons that I chose Global Comms was I felt like it kind of opened the doors in terms of, um, or kept open possibilities in terms of interests that I had. So, 
you know, one potential career um, trajectory for me is like doing comms at an international organization um, or even, you know, doing um, PR work for a multinational, things like that. I feel like the program is, is giving me kind of the training to do that. Um, I did do an internship at the Senate Press Gallery a while back. So I do have an interest in journalism, but not necessarily in, in pursuing a, a career as a journalist. So I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know if I, I'm answering the, the question very well, but but I do feel like the global comms will kind of set you up if, if you're interested in like international journalism, then, then it's not a bad option. Great, thank you, Caleb. Um, this next question is uh, more focused on Lamy and Anna. Uh, they ask, do you feel like you do or don't have access to a lot of opportunities that the Elliott School offers because of your international student status? I'm not really an international student, so I won't really be able to answer that question. Um, I'm happy to speak to it. Yes and no. There are some opportunities that do come up, and you, even if you could attend, you know, there's really not that much of a point going to it because um, that you wouldn't be able to access that opportunity. So when they have the CIA um, sessions or the State Department sessions, things like that, um, it's I, international students generally avoid those organizations because we can't attend them. But I think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of programming that Elliot does offer that international students can go to. But it's just the trick is essentially finding the right thing and doing the research for yourself beforehand. Um, because sometimes, you know, if you even if you do end up going to an event and then you find out that international students can apply. So it's it depends. Great, thank you, Lamy. Um, in terms of resources and support, uh, what kind of resources did you receive from the Elliott School in terms of funding opportunities such as jobs, internships, et cetera? So I know that um, uh, Sidhu talked a little bit about uh, the Graduate Career Development Center under the Graduate Student Services team. Um, so if anybody has any experiences with the GSS team, uh, feel free to let the student know. I can talk about that a little bit. I actually worked there over the summer as well, um, last summer, but GSS is really, really supportive. Um, again, I would say going in with a plan is better than not going in with a plan because then they kind of have a way to guide you. Um, if you're looking for federal jo jobs, the career coaches are very good with that. I believe Sharon and Tara, who's now left, um, but they're both, both former federal employees. And so they had a lot of really great connections in that space. Um, every week, like Sandu said, they send out essentially jobs that they get from their connections. Um, and you can apply. And if you do apply, letting one of them know that you applied so that they can reach out to that connection, um, which they're more than happy to do as well. Um, they hold the weekly career cafes where you can meet uh, people from different organizations um, or they host it themselves talking about different things that apply in your career. Um, they do cover letter workshops, resume workshops, all of that stuff. So they're really, really helpful. All right, well, Lummi, this actual next question is actually for you. Um, they ask, how would you rate the MIEP coursework in terms of quantitative difficulty? And also, could you elaborate on the capstone project? And I'll open up the capstone question to everyone on the panel since everybody will have to go through capstone. So um, after you answer the MIEP specific question, I'll open it up to the capstone specific question as well to everyone. 
question was the quantitative requirements for the MIP program. Um, it's tricky because I would say it's really up to the individual. So what you need as an, for the MIP program is I think an accounting class, you need a corporate finance class, you need to take the trade, the micro and the macro class. Um, and then you have to take a quantitative requirement. So that could be a basic that's for international affairs professionals. It could be a decision sciences class. It really, it could be whatever, whatever level of stats or math you believe you have, you can find a course that, um, if you can find a course that is at that level, um, you can take it essentially. The trick is, um, well, the problem is, it's not really a problem, it's more of a benefit. Dr. Moore is really, really flexible as the pro program director. And so you can make the program as quantitative or not, or not as you want. So I and a few other people have taken classes with the applied econ, econ department. So we've taken econometrics, time series analysis, all of that stuff, you're welcome to do that. But if you don't want to take that option as well, you really don't have to. So again, it's, you can take a basic stats class and be fine. Um, and take the micro and macro classes and you've met the requirements or you can choose to, you know, take it a step further and pursue other options. So, so now I wanted to open it up to the capstone question that they had. Um, and just kind of open that up to everyone on the panel and even Monica and just describing what uh, the capstone is for the MIPP program or the differences between what capstone and the leadership practicum is. So I'll just open that up to anybody who would like to speak on capstone in terms of if you've already started planning your capstone or within your capstone, if you could discuss, describe that process and uh, what that's been like for you so far. Um, I have capstone experience, so I'm a second year, and in the IDS program, we all do capstones, and it's recommended that you do one with international travel. Unfortunately, with the current pandemic, we aren't able to travel, but um, it's been a really good experience. Basically, we form groups in our first year towards the end of the year um, based on kind of regional or functional um, shared interests, so about groups of four. And then you have the summer to kind of create a client list and reach out to your network and also just cold email, um, tap into your professors and who they know just to reach out to different organizations in DC. And then you have the whole fall semester of your second or the first semester of your second year to secure a client. Um, so we are working with Plan International in Myanmar to help them um, include more gender mainstreaming in their uh, program activities. That's been a really great experience, just having a real world consultancy. It was one of the reasons why I chose GW. I really wanted to do this kind of practical experience. I wasn't as interested in doing a thesis. So um, it's been really nice and our professors are very well connected. They're all practitioners so just tapping into their knowledge and their resources because writing for development and writing for capstone is slightly different than purely academic writing. So. Um, it is, it's different, it's challenging, you work with a group and you have to, you know, maintain good relationships with everyone throughout the year. And so it really helps to just have a good working relationship with your team members and making sure that everyone's on the same page. But um, I've been, I've really enjoyed it so far and we're almost done. We are writing up our final report. As a sec also as a um, second year as well, I'm currently in Capstone. Um, I am in a development Capstone, slightly different from the IDS Capstone. We are able to work with people from other programs. So I'm the only MIP student actually in my group. Everybody else is in the Masters of International Affairs program. Um, it's pretty much the same thing. You work 
on teams of four, three to five, actually. Um, and then you come up with, you form your groups towards the end of the year, work on getting a client, agree on a topic, um, and then you consult with them. I am doing, my, my group is doing our capstone on the ACFTA, which is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the barriers to trade it removes for the African countries, as well as its ability to generate foreign direct investment to the continent of Africa. Um, we're working with the AU mission here. Um, and we're supposed to travel to Ethiopia to do our field research, which sadly didn't happen. Um, again, one of the reasons why I chose the LA school was for the capstone. But I think we've, it's still been a really great experience. And despite not being able to travel, we've been able to emails um, and even doing research here or trying to meet with people here, people are very, very happy to talk to you um, when you email them saying you're a student doing research. So it's been a good experience. So I can talk about the leadership practicum with the MIPP program. Um, as Joss, Joss mentioned, uh, we don't have a capstone per se. What we do instead is uh, students, new students are encouraged to take the leadership practicum at the start of their program, um, typically their first semester in that fall. Um, I didn't do it in the fall. I actually took the practicum in the springtime, uh, which wasn't a problem. Um, but what we do is we identify a leadership problem within our organization that we seek to solve. Um, if you're not working in an organization that you necessarily want to. Um, for instance, I, I'm looking to make a career change, which is one of the, the driving reasons why um, I'm studying in the MIPP. So I identified an organization that I do not currently work for. Um, and my topic was uh, professionalizing the Defense uh, Security Cooperation Agency through a form of gender mainstreaming. And that paper, the papers are usually 20, 25 pages long. Um, you have to have an oral presentation component, um, several in-class working activities uh, with your classmates, as well as you're required to share your, uh, your problem and solution with ex at least three um, agency or subject matter experts, and they have to provide feedback on if your uh, solution and your um, thought process is sound and could actually uh, be something that could address the problem, especially if you're not working in the organization, and that really can provide a lot of insight into um, if your ideas are something that had been proposed and maybe weren't seen as effective, um, or if you've actually identified something that can help you in landing a new position or a new role because you've identified a problem in that organization and you figured out some steps that could be taken uh, to address it. Um, so that for us really helps guide how you want to um, set up your studies for the rest of your program. Um, because MIPP has a little bit more flexibility, um, you're able to take courses, um, you know, across the Elliott School as well as throughout um, different GW graduate programs. So for me, I was able to identify which courses within national security and which courses within gender studies that I wanted to take that were ultimately going to be able to help me make that career change um, into a different profession that aligned with my studies as well. And Monica, it's funny that you mentioned that uh, and speaking about your intention to make a career switch, because our next question was focused on uh, is the MIPP better for enhancing your existing career or for developing the background to pursue a different focus? So can you speak on that a little bit as well? Yeah, I think it's, um, it, it really depends on the person. If you're looking to, you know, further enhance where you are or if you're looking to make a career change. Uh, the biggest thing that I recommend um, that's been the most influential is networking and connecting with different professors. Um, as long as, you know, I've been in the program, this is my second year, and really connecting with the professors, they've opened up their networks, um, as well as attending different networking events where you can talk to um, subject matter experts. And being that you have to have some, um, I think it's eight or 10 years of 
professional experience before uh, pursuing the MIPP program, when you're engaging with these individuals, you really have something to, um, to speak to as far as what has your experience been in the field. And if you're looking at making that career change, you can really um, uh, learn to uh, identify how some of the skills that you've gained professionally would be transferable. And if you're still trying to identify how your skills would be transferable to this different career, again, I definitely recommend um, speaking with the professors. Um, Dr. Levenger uh, is amazing. He's been very, very helpful. Um, and I know that he, he would love to engage in that kind of conversation with any incoming students in, in, in my PP program. Um, and the practicum is, is really a place to do that. Uh, we've had some students that wanted to get to more senior level roles and they used a problem that um, their leadership was trying to solve. And that was a way that they could take that paper in and say, hey, these are some of the strategies that I've identified that can help move our organization forward. And having you know, different students that are outside of the problem with a different perspective, as well as the different subject matter experts provide some of those recommendations, it can help you really address um, you know, promotional opportunities. But again, if you wanna make a change, there's opportunities there as well, it just depends on, on your goals. Great, thank you, Monica. Um, so our next question is a really great question. Um, that I'll actually come to at the very end and ask our panelists at the end. So, Nicole, your question here, I'm not skipping it intentionally. I'm just going to come back to it at the end, I promise. Um, but our next question is, is, what are the top student organizations you recommend joining? And which would you say have the most significant value add to your experience? I guess I will start that off. Um, I would recommend joining GSF, um, which is the Elliott School Graduate Student Farm. It hosts weekly events and it works with other organizations to host um, events that bring the Elliott School graduate population together. But it's a really great way to get to know a lot of your fellow graduate students, as well as other graduate students um, in other schools, because GSF has done events in the past that brings um, partnered with, you know, the Georgetown Foreign Service or done, it did a big four event as well. So it's a really great way to kind of network with people within Elliott and also at other schools. Um, so I actually uh, don't belong to any um, structured student organizations, um, but what I've done is really um, stayed focused on different events that are happening uh, where I would have more flexibility to still participate. And within the MIPP program, uh, we kind of uh, structured, you know, kind of a, as a, our own cohort. So we have a lot of activities, um, speakers that come in and speak with us as well as social activities. Um, so, even though it's not a student organization per se, um, it's really kind of operated like one because networking is such a big piece of, of our program. Great, thank you so much. So, Anna, this next question is for you specifically in terms of your role as a research assistant. They ask if you could describe a little bit more about your daily tasks, sorry, tasks, and what's your involvement with research papers and publications? Um, for my first job, I came into the project um, kind of in the middle of it. They're being, they've, they have been doing it for a year and a half now. So basically my job has to do with qualitative and quantitative like data analysis. So I'll go in and like clean data. I have experiences in data. So running some systems, going through interviews and, and sometimes like translations because I'm also fluent in Spanish and Portuguese. So I can kind of like see if, I, if it needs me to like translate them. And the second one, uh, I'm working with a professor right now that he's trying to publish a book. So I'm more of like doing qualitative analysis. So it will be like literary reviews and going through articles and just reading them 
or into books, which you're gonna do a lot in grad school and kind of like summarizing the main ideas and just like, that's basically what it is that I usually do. Great, thank you. Uh, so this next question is also for Anna, but I'm also gonna open it up to Sinthu and Caleb as well, because it's in terms of the language proficiency requirement at the Elliott School. Uh, and since you're all in programs that had a prerequisite for a language, um, they are wanting to know a little bit more about how you're planning to fulfill that foreign language requirement that Elliott School has for your program. And if you're planning on taking the Elliott School exit exam, or taking additional coursework or any other way that you're taking to fulfill that foreign language proficiency requirement. Um, I'm trilingual, so I had the option of taking it like either in Spanish or Portuguese, which was very easy. So yeah, I, I just took it and it's, if you're fluent in the language that you're trying to take it in, it's very simple, I would say, but all the time. I actually lived in Taiwan for a couple of years, so uh, I learned Chinese and then I, uh, my minor for undergrad was in Chinese. So just by virtue of the coursework I took, I, I fulfilled that requirement. I didn't even check to make sure that I was actually fluent, just, you know, that I passed those classes in undergrad, they assumed that I was. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a high, high bar, I, I feel like. Um, so so I, I don't have experience with like taking any exams or things like that. but. I, I would like to take more courses to keep the language up, but I don't have the time or money to, to take like Chinese courses at Elliott School. So I'm on my own for that one. But the, the requirements fulfilled, so that's the important part. Yeah, similarly for me, I minored in Spanish, so I was able to use that coursework, but I have a lot of um, peers who had to take a foreign language exam in a, in a language that they had learned in the past. So. It just takes a lot of, I guess, um, preparation to know that, you know, if you took French six years ago, it might be helpful to plan ahead and start brushing up on it before you plan to schedule because you definitely want to make sure you pass and fulfill your language requirements before your final semester. Great, thank you all. Um, so if you do have any additional questions in terms of foreign language proficiency requirement uh, or needing to meet that while you're at the Elliott School, please feel free to email us at esiagrad at gw.edu. And we can also help show you um, what you could be doing in terms of foreign language uh, requirements and also how you could possibly be exempt from having to take that exam. Um, but our next question is for LAMI specifically, would a student who does not have any prior professional work experience be at a disadvantage in the MIEP program are there fresh undergrads in the program or students coming directly from undergrad into this program? Yes, there are a lot of students who directly came in from undergrad and we have a couple that also worked a few years. I don't think it puts you at a disadvantage. Um, if anything, it actually gives you a slight advantage in terms of the international, the econ requirements. If you take, if you took econ or an econ major in undergrad, then you would have satisfied a lot of the intermediate micro and macro requirements. And so you don't have to worry about taking that exam again. Um, but to answer your question, it does not put you at a disadvantage. All right, thank you. So this next question is for Caleb uh, from a prospective global communication student who asks, do you think that the Global Comm program has helped open doors for you or will do so that were previously closed to you as a pre-graduate school student? And would you, uh, or what would you like to do post your master's program? Yeah, so I think I talked a little bit about options post-graduate school for me. Um, in terms of opening doors, I'd kind of echo what Monica was saying about I'm um, getting to know professors. I think, um, you know, a, a huge part of the price of grad school is is just being able to join that network of alumni. Um, and so to take full advantage of that, I think you just want to make sure that you know um, people that, that went to that school, professors that teach at that school, um, 
and pretty much all the professors that I've come in contact with are um, very, you know, open to, to getting to know you, happy to solicit advice um, or, or to give advice. Um, so, so I think it kind of remains to be seen. I'm still in my, my first year. Um, I did get a job through Elliott School. It's not really like a career job for me, though. It's it's a great job for me now. But um, I think just you know getting to know these professors and um, showing that that I have uh, you know work ethic and some basic level of intelligence. Hopefully that will bode well for me in the future. But I don't. Hopefully that's helpful. That you feel free to email me afterwards if if you want more uh, in depth answer. Great, thank you, Caleb. Um, so our next question is a little bit more international student focused. Uh, so Lamy, uh, this might be a great question to pose to you. Uh, we have uh, a couple students asking about the, if you could elaborate more on the international student experience, uh, the diversity of students and faculty uh, at the Elliott School, and also in terms of housing. Um, and I'll open this up to everyone on the panel in terms of housing, but specifically, they're asking about international student housing in DC, but I'll also open it up to the other panelists as well in terms of how you found housing in DC if you weren't uh, already here in the DC area before getting to the Elliott School. Um, so the international student experience, I will say it's a little bit different for everyone. It depends on a variety of factors. Um, I've been here, so I didn't go to school in DC, but I went to college in the States. So I've been here for a little bit longer. Um, so I didn't really take advantage of a lot of the international student programming as much as I could have. Um, but the international students office, which is over at the Marvin Center, um, does a lot, puts on a lot of programming that's directed towards international students specifically. Um, and in terms of Elliott School events, there's a lot of things that international students can attend and a lot of jobs um, and opportunities that are also sent that international students are eligible for. Um, and it's, I think one thing that we're also trying to work towards is making more resources available for international students. Um, the diversity of students, I would say it's a year by year basis. I know my program was last year was about half international students and the year that came in after my year, so the current first years, I think they may be about, they're a small cohort than we were, but there are fewer international students in that cohort. So I would say the diversity of students is something that does change every year, but it's a pretty diverse um, school and faculty. Um, and for housing, I would say there's a few good avenues you can use to find housing. I know there is an international student house somewhere around DuPont that a few international students have um, used, and I hear that it's a really great opportunity and you get to connect with a lot of international students um, working and schooling in the DC area. Um, I know GW has a graduate student housing building. I'm not really sure how that works. It's something you have to apply for sooner rather than later though, because um, I think it's a lot of law students um, get like first dibs or something like that. I'm not sure, I hope Josh can clarify that. Um, and then honestly, I found my housing both years just through, you know, apartments.com, Zillow and things like that. So there's different op options. Great. Thank you, Lamy. So it is now about four minutes till seven. So I wanted to pose one final question to our panelists tonight and uh, just kind of get uh, a kind of culminating uh, aspect of your time at the Elliott School and also why you chose the Elliott School. So our last question is, is why did you choose Elliott over other similar internationally focused schools in either 
in DC or outside of DC. Um, for me, there were two main reasons. One, I really liked the flexibility of my program, my IDS program. I liked how interdisciplinary I could make it. And I really liked that um, it had a capstone component, so it was very program focused. But then also Elliot as a whole, I think is very tailored to be um, accommodating to people who want to work full time or part time. So the classes are all in the evening and the professors are um, obviously very skilled and experienced people, but I found them to be more practitioner focused and less, um, you know, strictly academics, which I really enjoyed because they could provide a lot of real world experience. So I felt like the education I would get from GW and from Elliot would be very um, hands on practical and useful. So those were the two big reasons why I picked GW. Yeah, for me, um, flexibility was really important as well. Um, as you probably you might be able to hear, um, I had a lot of life changes happening uh, while I was at Elliott School, um, getting married, doing a promotion at my job, having a child, um, and being able to take courses in the evening um, was really, really important. And considering that I'm, you know, mid-career, um, again, as Cindy said, having um, practitioners available um, and having a course where I was able to gain not only academic experience, but professional um, skill based experience was important. Um, as part of the MIPP program, we have the option of doing one credit uh, skill builder courses um, where you're able to focus on things like formal briefing or negotiations or simulations, uh, which you can do a deep dive that may be challenging for you to do in a regular three credit um, academic course. Um, so having that variety was really important. Um, I, I did take a, a completed graduate certificate at um, Johns Hopkins SICE program. And I, you know, although I enjoyed my time at SICE, you know, it didn't provide that flexibility um, that was really, really key. Um, and I definitely, you know, really appreciate all of the networking that's available uh, within the Elliott School and um, having some visibility and seeing what type of um, discussions and talks and events were being held and what, um, you know, industry and government professionals that were coming in to speak with students was definitely a key driver. And again, you know, connecting with those individuals, having that networking opportunity and the proximity of you know, the World Bank and, and the location of, of where the campus is is really important because it's, it's much easier to make those connections. I guess I'll go ahead. Um, my answer is not as amazing <laughs> as my peers. I didn't know a lot about Elliot coming in. I barely did, did like a research, send my application in and hope for the best. Uh, what convinced me was the financial aid. I had a really good uh, fellowship offer. So I was like, yes, I'm in, I'll go. I moved to DC, I'm from Florida. So I was like, I'll, I'll deal with the cold, it's fine. And now that I'm here, I, I, it's been one of the best decisions I've ever made. Elliot, it's amazing. I've met amazing professors, I've made amazing connections. If you have the opportunity to go, I will say go ahead. So next, um, for me, it was a little bit of the combination that you've all mentioned. Um, I love the flexibility of being able to take classes in the evening, which opened up uh, more opportunities for internships during the day. Um, one thing that also struck me was how geared towards your future, like the future practice. It's a, such a practitioner program, um, and you have a lot of events and opportunities to really make those connections and your essentially thinking about your career the entire way through um, what you want to do. The capstone as well, that aspect of it and getting to do my own like consulting research really um, drew me to it. And this DNX doesn't really, the pro my program's changed as Josh mentioned um, since I started. So initially I was really drawn to the ability to um, kind of concentrate in two different areas. It was structured that way and in that concentration I could take classes so I could have like a business concentration um, and like an international development concentration that doesn't really exist anymore. 
Um, but what's, what exists now is essentially you can build your own concentration and do, there's a lot more flexibility. So it ended up working out. Um, so yeah, there, there are a few things that, that drew me to the Elliott School. I'll try to touch them on them all real quick. Um, if you're interested in like studying China, then uh, David Shamba is, is one of the most renowned uh, China people. Um, and, and he's at Elliott School, so that was kind of a draw for me. Um, I felt like the definitely the, the, the focus on on career application of, of the programs that, you know, like like all the other panelists mentioned, having classes at night um, was a draw. I felt like GW did a good job. Um, it really works hard to provide funding opportunities for students. Um, and a quick note on that. Um, you know, this is this is a real treat for all of you tuning in tonight. That I don't know if GW wants us broadcasting this this open secret, but if you do get do get funding, they tell you that it's um, you have to stay full time to get it. But if you ask, um, they'll still give you funding if you if you have to move to part time for a job or something like that. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, when I was switching to part time and um, because of my job, I was able to still secure um, some of that funding that I got. Um, so that was really great of GW. Um, and I think the biggest thing was there was just no other program like global communications, at least um, in, in this, in the DC area. There's, I mean, AU has, I think, what's called political communication. Um, it has less of an international affairs focus. But if you're somebody, like I mentioned, that's, you know, interested in international affairs and comms, um, global comms was kind of like the only, the only program that made sense. So, um, I, I didn't even, I, I applied to AU's program as well. Um, but, uh, GW is always my first choice. So. Great. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, it is now a little bit after 7 PM Eastern time and the end of this online current student panel. So I wanna thank uh, so much to Anna, Caleb, Lamy, Monica, and Sinthu for being on our panel uh, this evening and providing your insights and advice to our admitted students. And thank you all to our admitted students who tuned in this evening. Uh, once again, we have recorded this in evening session and we will be sending out the links. Uh, if you were not able to address one of your questions or you think of some questions later, please email us at esiagrad at gwu.edu. And the members of the graduate admissions team uh, and myself can address your questions and or put you in touch with one of our panelists. Uh, so please see the chat box for our contact info. Uh, but once again, thank you so much to our panelists tonight for tuning in. Uh, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening and that you stay safe and healthy.